Hi, today we're going to talk about another case study where markets failures have exist and policy interventions have been tried. The security of payment cards. So payment card networks are an example of what economists call a two-sided market. In such a market, two types of users are served by a common platform. Example two-sided markets include heterosexual online dating services, who need to attract both men and women to the service, and uh, many sharing economy services popular today, such as Airbnb who needs to find people to rent their spare rooms, as well as customers willing to stay in them. Two-sided markets exhibit cross-side network effects. The value of the platform to one type of user depends on the number of users of the other type also in the system. A two-sided market that only attracts one type of user but not the other won't be successful. There's a delicate balance to be struck in order to simultaneously grow both sides of the market. This makes network effects even more challenging to overcome for new entrants. For payment cards, the two types of users are cardholders and merchants. Cardholders interact with the issuing bank that actually issued the credit card, while merchants work with acquiring banks who manage their accounts by requesting payment from the cardholders issuing bank. Card networks such as Visa and MasterCard set the rules of interaction between issuing and acquiring banks. This includes who has to pay when fraud takes place, our key interest. So in the beginning, cardholders had no protection against fraud. U.S. cardholders got protection in the 1970s when regulations capped the liability for unauthorized transactions at $50. Banks in the credit card networks howled initially, fearing that the cost of covering fraud would be too big a burden. Turns out that these concerns were misguided. What the regulations actually did was create a strong incentive for people to start using credit cards by removing the fear of dealing with unauthorized transactions. Meanwhile, the card network set rules so that the card issuers had to pay for fraudulent transactions in most cases, which attracted more merchants to begin accepting credit cards. Hence, both sides of the market grew rapidly and a few card networks came to dominate. Furthermore, the issuing banks motivated by de developing real-time fraud detection to minimize their exposure to fraud losses. Two-sided markets are very difficult to grow. Once you have successful platforms in place, displacing them can be very difficult. This has substantial implications for security. In particular, it becomes harder for the dominant platform to justify spending money on to deploy more secure technologies, even if customers demand it. Magstripe technology used in credit cards is not very secure. The static numbers can be easily copied as we've all read about in the news. People have known this for decades. Many proposals have been made to improve security, including alternative payment platforms entirely with greatly improved security and yet none have really managed to threaten the dominant position credit card networks have. I'll also mention that the allocation of responsibility for security in a two-sided network is fraught with difficulty because there are so many parties involved. You have cardholders, merchants, issuers, and acquiring banks. Many of the disputes seemingly about security in these systems often degenerate into a fight over who should bear liability for reimbursing fraudulent transactions. To illustrate these challenges, let's now talk about a more secure technology that has been adopted by payment card networks. It's called EMV, which stands for Europay MasterCard Visa, the protocol's developers. EMV relies on smart cards embedded in the credit card, along with a PIN for authentication. Actually, because it's a massive standard that's used in many countries, it has myriad configurations, including a version that uses chips but relies on a signature instead of a PIN. But most of the time, a PIN is used. EMV was initially developed around 15 years ago, but adoption was initially slow. Understandably, merchants didn't want to spend large sums of money upgrading their terminals when the bulk of fraud costs were borne by issuers. Eventually, for many of the countries that have adopted EMV, the card networks rewrote the liability rules so that the merchant would now have to pay for lot fraud for any accepted transactions uh, where the chip and PIN weren't used. In some countries that have adopted EMV, Banks have begun, tr begun trying to dump liability onto customers, claiming that they must have authorized the transaction if the system reports that the PIN has been used. This is despite evidence that in some cases, criminals can make non-PIN transactions appear PIN verified. It's also worth noting that in the US, the, the laggard in adopting EMV has a very strong retail industry lobby that has long resisted EMV out of perceived unfairness over the changing liability rules. But in most of the world, EMV is already here, so the, so the question is, did the investment pay off? Has it reduced fraud by levels that would justify the large capital expenditures required? So to answer that, let's take a look at the fraud losses from Britain. Why the UK? Well, in most countries, fraud levels are kept secret, or at least not reported with any regularity or specificity. 
In Britain, by contrast, the UK Payments Administration publishes annual losses incurred by banks broken down by the very type of fraud. This doesn't give us the whole picture since these are only losses that the bank could not recover. But nonetheless, it paints a very useful picture that ni nicely illustrates the power of information disclosure in remedying information asymmetries. EMV was deployed in the UK between 2003 and 2005, with the rest of Europe following shortly thereafter. The surprising result from this graph is that the total fraud in the UK went up following the deployment of chip and pin. Fraud rose from 500 million pounds in, in 2005 to a peak of 700 million pounds in 2008, before falling slightly. But what's going on here? Well, as predicted, losses from counterfeit cards and lost in stolen cards fell, but this was accompanied by a huge spike in card not present fraud, as seen in red. Fraudsters reacted by, to the deployment of chip and pin by changing tactics, from using copied cards on British high streets to skimming mag stripes of cards and cashing out cloned cards in countries that hadn't yet adopted EMV, or by making online purchases. This figure illustrates how attackers can quickly adapt to the security mechanisms that we defenders put in place. It also shows the importance of externalities in security investment. UK banks may upgrade their own infrastructure, but because payments are global, attackers can exploit weaknesses elsewhere in the system that can still influence the bottom line of those who have already spent money to improve their security. So what's the bottom line for EMV? Was it a worthwhile investment or not? Undoubtedly, EMV has improved the security of in-person payments, but it's also clear that it's not a complete solution by any means. Instead, we can see that payment card security is a weakest link problem. Countries adopting EMV, such as the Netherlands, have seen improvements like a drastic fall in card, fraud, in card skimming fraud. But fraud with Dutch cards, like those of the UK, have now moved to other, other countries that haven't adopted, such as the US. But if business reasons incentivize keeping the weakest link in place, then, the, then de facto we're talking about risk acceptance you now, not mitigation. So what else can be done for card security? Beyond improving the payment cards themselves, considerable effort has been made in improving operational security practices of participants in the payment system. The Payment Card System Data Security Standard is a set of rules written by card networks designed to improve the security of merchants. The idea is to root out unsafe practices such as storing cards unencrypted or transmitting them over networks unencrypted. Merchants who suffer breaches and are found to be non-compliant with PCI standards are assigned responsibility for fraud in addition to facing punitive fines. Unfortunately, in practice, merchants are often discouraged from even bothering to comply because those that do comply but later suffer a breach are frequently declared to be non-compliant retroactively. So notably, the PCI approach is entirely self-regulatory and done outside the purview of government regulators. PCI has been successful in improving the practices of many participants, but has been less successful in actually reducing the number of breaches of card data. One explanation is that PCI sets the bar for compliance rather low. So we know about the PCI's limited success because of data breach disclosure requirements that are now in place. These laws correct information asymmetries between cardholders and merchants. They undoubtedly also pressure companies into spending money on security in hopes of staying out, out of the news. So what's frequently missing from the breach disclosures, however, is that the amount of card fraud that actually takes place. So frequently companies involved in mega breaches intimate that, they have, that very little fraud actually takes place as a direct result. But these claims are hard to substantiate. In fact, one could argue that the actual magnitude of fraud, as measured by the number of victims and the loss amounts, matters much more. A few countries, like the UK, publish good information, as we've already seen. Most countries don't, however, and this is to the detriment of everyone's cybersecurity because we're left wondering if things are getting better or worse with no reliable way to know. Let me conclude by briefly mentioning that payment card fraud losses only capture a portion of the harm imposed by card fraud. Direct losses definitely matter because they represent criminal profits and bank losses. But indirect costs may actually dwarf direct losses entirely. If people stop shopping at stores that suffer breaches or limit their online banking or shopping out of fear of fraud, then this will create a substantial drag on the economy. While hard to measure, most estimates put these indirect costs at one to two orders of magnitude higher than the direct losses attributed to fraud. So when possible, indirect costs should be accounted for when considering security investments, especially when you're considering accepting a risk rather than taking steps to avoid or mitigate that risk. So this concludes our discussion of market failures and interventions. Thanks for your attention and goodbye.